One. Good morning. Are you having fun? Yeah. All right. So today uh, it is my uh, great great pleasure to introduce the uh, today's seminar speaker, Dr. Jerry Wallets from BAE Systems. Uh, he is the vice vice president and general manager of BAE Systems Fast Lab. He's also been a just the the great believer and also a great supporter of this program. And one of the reasons we can scale up this program the way it is today was because of his support. So with that introduction, so let's welcome Jerry. Thank you, Bob. All right, thank you, Bob. Uh, it's barely morning. Uh, I'm looking at the clock here. So uh, noon will be. Uh, here before we know it. Uh, this is a great group, great opportunity to support uh, what I consider to be the world's best STEM program uh, around. So uh, first off, congratulations to all of you to making it to uh, the campus and uh, the opportunity to work on these projects. Uh, as Bob says, I uh, work for BA Systems, uh, Fast Labs. We get the incredible opportunity to solve some of the world's uh, toughest technical challenges and often decades before the commercial sector. And uh, one of the topics and one of the areas that for which we've done that is autonomy. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. So just to kind of get things going, how, just out of curiosity, anybody read AvWeek? All right, has anyone heard of, okay, we got a cup, Aviation Week, right? If you're in an aerospace discipline, Right? This is the periodical you read. Right? Now, look at that heading. Does that surprise anyone in the audience that it says autonomy is ready? Does that surprise anyone? All right? It should surprise you. Because right? I will tell you that we only went public with this last year, one day before I gave the speech here last year, on Capitol Hill. And our nation's leaders actually did not know the story that I'm going to tell you today. Some of them knew it. Most of them forgot it. And um, with there's so many rotations that occur through government, all that corporate memory disappeared. And at one point, someone was giving a confirmation hearing. And they said, we're behind an autonomy in the US. And we got to start working with the commercial, the self-driving car industry, to get caught up. And that's when the scientists said, enough. And this is why this briefing uh, was generated. So before I get into that, a brief introduction of BA Systems. Um, we are the third largest defense contractor in the world today. That's going to be changing with the mega mergers that are going on. Um, so uh, we, we produce planes. We build our own planes. We produce electronics and the equipment that goes on those planes. We build ships, um, nuclear submarines, nuclear aircraft carriers, right, frigates. Um, we are the leading provider of combat vehicles for the allied nations, right? We produce more combat vehicles than any other, and we do all the medium and large caliber uh, gun systems for both navies and ground forces. And we also have a very vibrant uh, cyber business. So we are truly a global company, uh, four major markets. Uh, what you see here is we do span the world, uh, representation in 80 countries. Within the U.S., we have major facilities in 31 states, employees in all 50 states. And as Bob said, I run the single unified R&D organization for all U.S. operations uh, called Fast Labs. Um, we span just the R&D organization. We are in 10 different states with employees in, I believe, 21 states, right? So, uh, and we have responsibility for all R&D for U.S. operations as well as for the global uh, company. Now, BA Systems came about through merger and acquisition. As, as a result, so did our R&D organization. And in fact, I entered BA Systems through uh, the acquisition of a company called AlphaTech, which was formed by five MIT professors and was acquired uh, by BA Systems in 2004. And this will be part of our story going uh, forward. So if we take a look at what we focus on, right, uh, our, our vision is we, uh, we secure the future through fearless innovation. 
Um, one of the uh, largest R&D organizations in the U.S. is called the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA. And the head of DARPA had a chance to brief our board of directors. And the head of DARPA, this is a presidential appointee position, said, when the government says it can't be done, when the other defense contractors say it can't be done, if it does get done, it's generally VA Systems that gets it done for us. And that's our reputation that we're very proud of. So what you see here, these are our focus areas, and autonomy is one of our five. So to get things rolling here with our autonomy conversation, I'd like to start off with, a, as I like to say, a working definition of what I mean. Because autonomy is one of those, it's actually an ill-defined term. Right? It's not like gravity. Gravity is scientifically defined. The word autonomy is not. Therefore, autonomy means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So the fur for the purpose of this talk, we're talking about unmanned aerial vehicles. There's a plural, capable of navigating and achieving mission objectives without remote pilot control. Right? So this is, they are intelligent. Right? And that's why we call it intelligent autonomy. A couple examples up here. RQ-4, uh, the Global Hawk, first flew in 1998. Over 400,000 flight hours serving the country since. Uh, X-45, unmanned combat air vehicle, which we'll talk a lot more about. Um, first flew in 2002, whereby dozens of air vehicles swarmed together to achieve mission objectives. Um, you may have heard about Perdex. It was on 60 Minutes. It's a product of the MIT Lincoln Lab Beaverworks, right, where they dispensed uh, on the order of 100 of these small UAVs from two F-18 Super Hornets, and they all swarmed to complete a mission objective. So, by the way, this is going to be interactive. So it's, quest it's the first quiz. All right. So when was the first autonomous UAV flight in history? All right. All right, okay. I like this. So we're all... Is there anyone passionate about one of these that they'd like to speak to? Yes. B, why? Perfect. But you're wrong. <laughs> so I just told you Global Hawk. But that's not the right answer. Right? The air launch cruise missiles of the 1980s. And then, boom, takes us to World War II. But since I told you you were wrong, this takes us to, so when did the Wright brothers first fly? Think about how close it was to that first flight. So the answer is the Kettering Bug. How many people have heard about the Kettering Bug before? Show of hands. Were you saying A all along? No. No. All right. <laughs> Honesty. So, all right. So 1918, uh, the Dayton Wright Airplane Company, uh, the Wright brothers were Wright, right, is part of that name, uh, had the first autonomous UAV named the Kettering Bug. It flew 40 miles, no uh, pilot required. So they set the, they essentially set, they counted the number of propeller rotations. They determined the distance that the target was away. They had calculations of the winds and they launched it. And when the propeller rotations hit the total number, it killed the engine and went into a dive. That is just simply a torpedo. Air, it is a torpedo with wings. So how is it that in 1918, we were doing autonomy, let alone I just told you about UCAV, teams of autonomous, right? But yet we're only hearing about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and self-driving cars today. How did we solve that problem? When was AI formed? When was it founded? Anyone? Ballpark? 50s. 1950s. 1918 is before 1950. We are all agree, right? So what happened? How did it happen? Yes? In 1918? 
Oh, for machine learning, sure, I'm there. But how did they do autonomy without machine learning? Yes? Uh, the definition of autonomy changes over time. OK. Well, their original machine didn't have, they didn't have the sensors at that time to be able to make it. It was the sensors or the equipment or the computers in order to make it, to make decisions of its own. All it did is count how many times it fell the Mm-hmm. But, right, and I will also say, where well, we're going to get to this, it also did other things, right? But how, do you, how, how did it go know to go from point A to point B? No, the winds changed. There were gyros. The system had gyros. Yes? It was mechanical instead of digital? Mechanical, yes. It was mechanical, but what did they use? If it's not AI machine learning, what would be the alternative to that? Yes? No. All right. <laughs> they used feedback control. And they used a discipline called control and estimation. All right? So here I am working on this, this, this technology. And everyone wants to talk about AI and machine learning. But we've always been doing it. And what I found out is I found myself briefing very senior members of the, uh, of the defense establishment. And some of them are pilots. And they, in fact, did not know. They thought they flew the plane. They were under the illusion that they actually flew a plane. The reality is the feedback control system flies the plane. The pilot just provides inputs to it, which, or, which we may ignore. So what this led this to is that I had to start giving briefs to senior uh, members of the military about something that you learn in physics and in engineering school. So the best way to start at that is tell everyone that they actually have a feedback control system. All right, this is the most complex feedback control system known in the world. The next step, it's always been here. So the first recorded mechanical feedback control system is 50 years after Alexander the Great died. Yeah, wow. Let's go back to aviation. How did the Kettering bug come about? So if you take a look at the very top, the first autopilot is now 1912, nine years. And what they did is they took um, a gyroscope from battleships and the Sperry Corporation, and they shrank them, and they put it onto an aircraft. And in fact, what Lawrence Sperry did at an air show outside of Paris, before there was a Paris air show, is there was a grandstand. He flipped his navigation augmentation system on, or autopilot, and it was a wing leveler. It kept the wings level. And he jumped out of that cockpit and walked out on the wing and waved to the crowd. Turned the aircraft around, flipped the switch on, jumped out, and went out, and now is beyond the opposite wing and waved at the crowd again. Eventually, he did die in an air accident. <laughs> um, 1912, during World War II, as our aircraft flew fire, higher, faster, we needed to do what was called control augmentation. And they, had, they didn't have computers, so it was all mechanical. It was all analog. And it was springs and masses, and they changed the properties of what the stick felt like at different altitudes as well as in maneuvering. And then finally, with the advent of the computer and the ability to put processing on board aircraft, the advent of digital flight controls happened in the 60s into the 70s. And we started designing aircraft with relaxed stability or aircraft that were not designed for aerodynamics but for electromagnetic properties, such as stealth. This all happened over and over again in the aerospace industry for aircraft before we started looking at autonomous cars. None of this has AI in it. And there's a reason why. It's because this is based upon theory and math and theoretical foundations that uh, perform, uh, support safety and performance. Today, artificial intelligence does not have that theoretical basis. So where safety and performance matters, feedback control is your technology. All right. So with that, we then had to give them an example. 
and need an example that everyone would understand. So a thermostat. A thermostat, we talked about the Honeywell. Uh, I, I guess I skipped over that, but Honeywell invented a thermostat. The Industrial Revolution would not have occurred without feedback control. So everyone has a home thermostat. So at our house, this is in Arlington. I know we've got two people here from Arlington High. Right? This is my house on Rhinecliff in Arlington, up in the Heights. And as you can see, this is the type of snow we get up in the Heights during the winter here. And that is my daughter that is now 17 standing at the door, and she likes to open up that door as I'm shoveling snow. And so our objective is to maintain the house temperature at 68 degrees, but there's constant fluctuations in the temperature outside, and it doesn't help that my daughter keeps opening up the front door. So what we do in feedback control is that you're going to measure the house temperature. The way the Honeywell thermostats do is they actually have a thermal couple, not like this, but it's actually embedded on the board. It takes a measurement. And it determines the delta in temperature. And based upon that, it goes into a controller. That controller says, I need heat. So it generates a low voltage signal, sends it to the furnace. Furnace turns on, starts to add heat. And this process will repeat until the house achieves 68 degrees. Everyone understand that, right? Feedback control. It's that simple. All right? So um, I was fortunate last year, the setup briefer talked about the classical control problem. So I'm going to uh, uh, briefly touch on that. So if you, if you take a look at the house, right, we call that a plant or process. All right. If you take a look at the desire to maintain that temperature, that's our performance metric. If you look at the variations in temperature outside, those are called disturbances. You have sensors that generate noisy data that have to be filtered. And you have controllers that make things change. And in between that is estimation and control, All right? And again, I'll go back, right? These are, this is science. This is a fundamental to engineering. This is what you get in an engineering program. There's a whole discipline on the estimator side, and there's a whole discipline on the control side. So this continues over and over again. So why do we do this, right? So these are sort of on the, on the, uh, on your left side of this chart, these are kind of the, the rudimentary, right? This reduces the workload of humans. But the most important part that you learn when you take a classical control course in college is the right side. All four of those are theoretically proven. And this is where the math, science, and theory, and that coupling to have theoretical proof. In aircraft, we do not test for every turbulence condition. We defined a boundary for which we know the aircraft is stable. We test a couple of points, verify the math. Aircraft is stable. All right? And so in this particular case here, a thermostat works in everyone's home, even though every home is different. There's different sizes, different shapes, different parts of the world. Same thermostat. Thermostats work for the same uh, uh, reduces uh, effects to disturbances. So the same thermostat works in the winter as it does in the summer. In the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, North America, Europe, same thermostat. There is no special program required to do that. Uh, steady state airs. When you command 68 degrees, it will get your house to 68 degrees. It will not get it to 64 degrees, right, or 75. It gets it to 68, right? And then the final one, the transient response. Feedback control will get it there as quick as possible. All right, so how does this apply to now UAVs? So let's take our plant process sensors and effectors and start off and say, that's an air vehicle. And the effectors and the sensors on that air vehicle, it's called a mission system. And you've got vehicle management systems, you've got a variety of different sensors on vehicles. Effectors can be both uh, uh, kinetic and non-kinetic. You have communication, navigation, ID. But in our particular context, going back to our definition, we care about teams. Uh, UAVs, and those UAVs are in a battle space, right, trying to achieve an objective with a lot of other stuff around them. So that becomes our plant and process for the problem I'm discussing. The performance metric is you have a commander somewhere that says, UAVs, I want you to go do something. Go find me. Go provide me surveillance. Do something. 
right? The job of the autonomy is to figure out how this team is going to achieve that. Think of the football analogy. You got the players on the field, everyone has a different role, the purpose is to score a touchdown. You have disturbances, you have noise, right? And we call this the fog of war, it's a reality. You don't have perfect estimation. You have a lot of data coming from everywhere and you have a lot of commands. You have to determine where the vehicle should fly, at what timing and when, how they support one another, when sensors need to be turned on and turned off and so on. It is a highly, highly complex problem. And then from that, you need to be able to take all those noisy measurements, come up with your best representation of what's going on, and then provide the commands. So this is the, the, the analogy, but in what's interesting is that when you look at this from a context of you know, what the Department of Defense and our allies worry about is that it's not just us, but you also have someone who is trying to prevent you from achieving your mission, and you're trying to prevent them from achieving their mission. And this is a game theoretic problem. Right, absolutely fascinating problem. And if you take where we're at today is that we applied a time scaled separation that if you solve it quick enough, your adversary appears to be static and you can solve this problem. So a very important problem that I'd like to make is this is not a script of actions. This is an opt a optimization problem that has to be solved in real time. The other important thing I'd like to highlight is that if you're having a hard time finding a solution, you're in the air. You can't pull off to the side of the road and wait for the system to compute. By the way, people are shooting at you, right? So you've got to determine in real time, right, all of these things. So what we did is we coined this, right, if I go back to uh, stability augmentation system, right, and what we had to do for fly-by-wire or aircraft that were designed for electromagnetics, that's a stability augmentation. Those generally run on the order of 100 hertz, right? Control augmentation, these are pilots are putting in commands that are going to harm the aircraft. Actually, the wings are going to rip off if you actually try to implement that, control augmentation, right? Those run at a slower rate. Let's go on the order of about 10 hertz. Navigation augmentation or the original autopilot, this is that next logical loop uh, to be closed. And that's what we've uh, uh, been working on. So the decisions, right? So this is an optimization problem. You gotta figure out what to do, when to do it, which UAV is gonna do it, how they're gonna do it, all in the reality of the physics of the miracle of flight, right? Every degree of elevator or aileron deflection matters right, in these type of problems uh, for a variety of reasons. So with that, when was the first time we flew teams of autonomous vehicles to this definition I have here? Yes, 2001. I like where you're going. I like that a lot. You're close. Yes. 1998. All right, close. 2004. You know what it was? Anyone want to guess? Yes. No, 2004 is the right number. <laughs> Anyone want to guess what flew in 2004? Teams. Yes. Uh, you got an X right. Yes. Oh, you got the X and the 5 right. X45. So Perdix was 2014. Yes, that made 60 minutes. What did make 60 minutes was teams, these type of vehicles. And these things, these vehicles are not small, right? This general class, you can go to the Air Force Museum and see these vehicles there today. Um, but you're talking this, uh, this class, the X45 family was on the order of the size of an F-16. That's big, yes. Why do they resemble stealth planes? Because that's probably where the most interest is. All right, X-45 was a DARPA program, um, and that is exactly, so you wanna talk about the miracle of flight, 
There is no tails on these aircraft. These are very, very, very unstable aircraft, all right? And so, uh, which makes the problem even, you know, from my perspective, all the more interesting. So how could it be, I said first flight of UCAV was in 2002, I said that earlier, and the first teams of UAVs flew in 2004, how did we get there? Well, the first contract, and I, you know, for those that cannot see this, this is on, the, uh, on your left. Distributive cooperative control of teams of autonomous tactical UAVs was in 2001 in this country. First contract, All right? The principal investigator was brilliant, charming, witty, I just have to say. First publication, 2002. How is it that no one knows about this? Right? Because we didn't tell people. Right? We did all the right things. We published. Um, we executed contracts. By the way, we have never stopped executing contracts ever since. All right? So, it, uh, so this started in 2000. We're now 2001. We're coming up on 20 years of consecutive development um, and I believe 13 years of continuous flight testing. So how do you solve a problem like this? And I'm going to go right back to, in engineering, if you've got a problem to solve, what's the first thing you do? Got to develop a model if you don't have the system ready to go. Now, this is pretty complex. So the approach that we have here, right, is stochastic hybrid uh, uh, dynamic, stochastic hybrid dynamical modeling. And this is Professor Branicki. He was actually a student here at MIT. Uh, we did not overlap. Uh, he graduated from LIDS, which is this, you know, this new shiny building because we used to be down here. Um, and essentially what you do is you take every single entity in the battle space and you define what are the first order effects that make a difference, right? You may pay attention to some of the second order effects, but everything else you have to ignore. And the reason why is that uh, Bellman coined this in 1957, the curse of modeling. You can fall in love with mathematically modeling the world. And what you will do is you'll spend all of your time, all of your energy, and you will try to generate the best simulation possible. And you'll never actually solve a real problem. And this is one of the challenges you will have as you continue on, is that how much modeling do I need and is it adequate? So here's the framework we had to use because we have both continuous dynamics and discrete dynamics, right? Fuel is a continuous dynamic. And oh, by the way, bad things happen when you run out of it. And when you run out of fuel, it becomes a discrete event, right? It's called aircraft loss, right? Crash and burn. So with this modeling framework, in understanding the curse of uh, uh, dimensionality, the next one was you have to identify what type of control problem is this. So fundamentally, the problem I'm describing is a dynamic uh, decision-making problem under uncertainty. And that class of problems, Bellman identified the, the optimal solution for that is called dynamic programming. It's a Markov decision problem. The solution is dynamic programming. And essentially, the gist of it is, is that you have to take a look at your immediate risk and rewards and balance that against future risk and rewards. But the challenge you have is that every decision you make today impacts the future opportunities or risks. And to give you the perfect analogy is that if I fly over here, because I think something's interesting over here, I had to spend a lot of fuel potentially to get over here. And I may have an assumption that I can fly straight back. But something happens while I'm over here, and it could be because I'm over here, that something pops up, and I can no longer fly straight back without getting smoked. So now I have to fly all the way over here, and guess what? I may not be able to get back now. So every decision has to be balanced about what could possibly happen in the future based upon I know, what I know. Now, this problem, as Bellman identified, actually can only be solved for a small, set, a small subset of problems because of what's called the curse of dimensionality. We have the curse of modeling, the curse, curse of dimensionality here. And essentially what it says is the number of entities grows exponentially. 
And this goes into a class of problem called non-polynomial hard, NP-hard. And in those problems, what that means is that even if you could find a solution, you actually can't determine whether or not it's an optimal solution or not. All right? It's one of the toughest classes of problems that we face in our industry. So what did we do about this is that in all problems that you can't solve in closed form, you've got to come up with approximations. And again, like modeling, you have to be very, very intelligent on how you do that. So in the 1990s, uh, uh, Professor uh, Dimitri Versakis, here again at MIT and Lincoln, started working on what's called approximate dynamic programming. And in this approach, again, you do a calculation of what the current reward is, risk and reward, but you come up with an approximation as best you come. And the other thing you do is you solve it in real time for only the situation you're in. You don't try to solve it for every potential situation in the world. And it was only by this approach could we come forward with a tactical uh, uh, closed form solution. So this takes me to here. So there's got to be artificial intelligence and machine learning somewhere, right? Because you can't show up and give a briefing without talking about it. So, so let me suggest that we got to this point here today using estimation and control. Right? But I will tell you I am adamant that I there is a role. So now I'm going to tell you a story. And then, uh, again, I'm going to go back to a time when you guys were not born. All right? uh, so I'm sad to say that I was, I was getting ready to graduate from uh, here at the tail end of 99. And I did it in January of 2000. All right? Why be the last in the millennium when you could be the first? Perfect sense, right? So I'm looking at this, and I'm, and I'm employed at McDonnell Douglas. That became Boeing in St. Louis. And I'm supposed to go back and work on this X45 UCAF program. And up to this point, I'm, I've done reconfigurable flight controls for tailless fighters. That's the tailless, very aggressive aircraft. And, but we were already flight testing them out at NASA, Dryden, Edwards Air Force Base. So I'm looking at what's going to be that next hard problem that needs to be solved. And I'm supposed to go work this UCAF program. And so I started asking around and talking to them as I'm getting ready to leave MIT and go back. And what I was told is, well, it's actually, where are these vehicles going to do? And, and how are they going to coordinate themselves before this word autonomy right, became something that we talked about? I said, that's interesting. But they said, don't worry. We've got that problem solved. I go, dude, you know, how, do you or how are you going to solve that problem? Well, at that time, the government had spent uh, close to half, half a billion dollars over two decades developing AI expert systems for both fighter aircraft and rotorcraft. And I was told that those systems were going to solve that. Now I sat back and I said, OK, that's interesting. Uh, in my dissertation here at MIT, I used estimation theory, I used control theory, and I used AI to solve my reconfigurable problem. And I looked at that and said, I don't think that's going to work. So that was with an insight that I then went, and you'll hear about this uh, professional cliff diving. I quit Boeing and went and joined the startup company AlphaTech with the, I'm going to go develop this at AlphaTech uh, here you know, in Burlington. And so um, we started working on this. You see the contracts when they were let. And by 2002 on the UCAF program, we had replaced the AI-based solution after they had spent a lot of money on it because it wouldn't work. And this was part of that, the crashing of the second wave of AI, if you're familiar. We're, we're into the third wave of AI now. And this is where the machine learning and the tools, it still, I will tell you, will not solve the uh, estimation and control problem. However, there is a good role. One of the key assumptions I talked about earlier was that if we close our loop fast enough, we didn't have to worry about the game theoretic problem that exists with the fact that we actually have an adversary that's trying to thwart our objectives, and we're trying to thwart them. So if you take a look at this, this is truly where we're at right now, is we're actually merging our teams today, and we're working on this game theoretic problem. And so we've added uh, a, a learning block to our architecture for the sole purposes now of supporting not only enhanced situational awareness, but working on the game theoretic solution. And we have now, we're very fortunate to have active contracts and hopefully uh, uh, many more uh, to come in this area. So with that, what I'm going to do is kind of just jump through very quickly kind of the status of where this technology is, right? And then we're going to open this up to uh, questions. 
and we're going to take this one block at a time. So if you take a look at estimation, again, this is, you can get a degree in estimation theory, just in estimation theory alone. It's very signal processing based, but if you look at the challenges that it poses here, is that every sensor generates noisy measurements. There is no such thing as a perfect sensor. Right? So you need to take those, sen those measurements from each sensor and you need to fuse them and come up with what we call a track. This is what you believe reality to be. So you got to do that for a single sensor. And then the next problem you see is that you could have multiple sensors that are actually recording the same thing, but they could be different phenomenologies. One could be a uh, um, RF-based, one could be a EOIR-based, but they're still recording the same thing. They record different things, but the idea is that you want to correlate the two tracks that you get from the two different sensors. That's still all within a single vehicle. The next thing you go is we talked about constellation of vehicles. And it's not just air flying, air, you know, air breathing vehicles, spacecraft, right, social media, right, you name it. And the idea is to fuse all of that together. So with that, you can see the richness that exists in just estimation theory alone for these problems. And it goes from left to right here to bigger and bigger, more complicated solutions that occur in the estimation field. So with that problem as a backdrop, so let's, some of the technologies that are used today. So this technology is TRL-9. Uh, TRL, does that ring a bell? Does that make sense to everyone? That means it is used today uh, by allied uh, forces, right, and has been for some time. So if you take a look at this problem, um, you know, technologies and, uh, you know, the different uh, types of technologies that are being used, multiple hypothesis tracking, uh, graphical methods, probabilistic reasoning, and we're also actually embedding machine learning into this as now. What you'll see in this block diagram architecture, there's a lot of filtering and normalization that goes on, right? What our scientists have learned is that there's a richness of data that you're better off running the machine learning algorithms on it before you filter them because you will find things, you will learn things that you wouldn't otherwise do by the very rigid filtering that goes on in that area. So in the control side of things, again, every single sensor needs to be managed, right? You need to tell sensors how to point. If you have an EOIR, I know uh, the autonomous, you guys have fixed EOIR, right? You don't have a gimbaled sensor, right? Um, but if you have a gimbaled sensor, you actually have to tell it what voltage is to put in so that the sensor slews and looks that way. Now, the problem with those types of sensors is that they need to figure out actually where they're looking. So GPS in itself is not sufficient to say, here's where I'm at. You have to take into account the aircraft attitude, and you also have to take into account drift errors. So for these types of sensors, you want to look here, you want to look here, you want to look here, you want to look here. But every time you do a hard maneuver or you hit turbulence, your sensor drifts from where it thinks it really is. And you have to constantly not only get those images and pictures, you also have to constantly worry about the health and wellness of your sensor and recalibrate that. And one of the ways we do that is, hey, I know where Bob is, right? I have geo-registered Bob. So what I'm going to do is occasionally, even though I'm over here, I'm just going to turn around and say, there's Bob. And if Bob isn't in the center of my image, and I thought it, he should be in it, I will just look at that bias and I will correct it, right? All navigation systems do this continuously, right? GP, you know, depending upon the accuracy required, we use GPS fix. But if you take a look at uh, how many people saw Apollo 13, right? All right, how many people, uh, so Apollo 13, what they were doing is they were looking at the stars. And remember when they uh, booted up uh, the command module again after the, uh, the cold sink? They had to reset the INS, which was produced here in the instrumentation lab, just saying. And they had to get star fixes to remove the bias, right? So sensor resource management has to do all of that. But if you take a look at the next one, vehicles do have to fly and get from point A to point B. And guess what? It's really important that they don't hit each other. Don't underestimate how hard that is, 
right? You don't underestimate how hard it is to get timing consistent in a team of vehicles. And by the way, when vehicles are flying, they all experience weather. And if you're flying this way and a vehicle's flying this way, it's the same wind conditions, it has a very different effect on the trajectory of the aircraft, right? So you have to deal with all those complexities. And then at the next level, you have constellation of vehicles. They can be in space, they can be in the air, they can be under sea. They all have to be coordinated, right? So that's the richness of this problem. And again, we do work across this entire spectrum. And if you take a look at the technologies, dynamic programming, stochastic optimization, model predictive control, there's a whole arsenal of tools that come to bear that you learn in, you know, in your engineering programs when you get into this field. And then to the learning part, right? What AI does really, really well, right, is pattern matching, anomaly detection. It can handle very large volumes of data, right? What it doesn't do well with, which I highlighted earlier, is due to the lack of theoretical foundation, it's application for both safety or, sec or, safety, um, or where performance matters. So you never, if, if you find out your, your local nuclear power plant is using AI to maintain it, move, right? Um, that's why control systems are used to control nuclear reactions. Um, so if you take a look at this, this is where it's really fascinating is that if you do take a look at what the developments have occurred in this field, is that they're really good at what we call the needle in the haystack problem, but they're even better at determining which haystacks you wanna look for the needles in, right? And we call this left of event predictions, which is perfect for its ability to support a game theoretic solution. Right, so if you're playing chess, right, or I think Go was the, the latest one, right, it's imperative that you predict what your chess opponent is going to do. If you want to be a chess master, that's what you have to do. And you're not doing that for the next move, right? You're trying to do predictions for three moves, four moves, right? The further you can predict what your adversary, and by the way, every single one of their subsequent move is going to be a response to the move you just did. Right? This is where the opportunity space. So very good today at pattern matching, anomaly detection, now very good at uh, predicting left, what we call left of event before the big event, right? finding all of the different needles and putting them together, processing data that it is impossible for humans to process all that data. Right? Now we're applying it uh, to this context. So again, uh, I should have said the, the so estimation side, I said TRL9. Control side, TRL-8, right? The learning portion here of doing like left of event productions, TRL-9. All very, very mature technologies. So where are we headed? Um, so I, I forgot to mention earlier, we just bought a UUV company. Um, so we have certainly been very, very focused on uh, the air domain, air to ground, air to air. Um, and if you take a look, and our small sat teams right here, right? Go small sats. Um, so if you take a look at that, satellites, aircraft, ships, submarines, UUVs, all of it, right? We call that cross-domain operations. Um, so that's a focus area. Um, we have uh, work that we're doing to bring this technology. Uh, so combat vehicles, I told you about, we're a big provider of combat vehicles. So just like what we're doing for aircraft, we're bringing that to combat vehicles. We're bringing that to under, uh, undersea. Satellites have always been autonomous, right? It's always been that way, right? But now the idea is for them to be responsive in the timescales for which airborne operations uh, need to be responsive. Uh, generally, we've solved problems in this class, about three dozen. Um, that's about the size. Remember the curse of uh, dimensionality, right? Uh, so we are focused on hundreds to thousands of entities uh, in the swarm. Uh, next, um, game theoretic formulation, I touched on that, right? And that's bringing the AI machine learning uh, to bear. Uh, cyber resiliency, uh, does this ring a bell with anyone? 
right? This is, these are pretty powerful things, right? And if you put autonomy on something and then it gets hacked and then gets used against you, that's like your worst day ever. So for these technologies, and I know we've got, uh, we're hacking something over here. Yeah. What are we hacking this year? I saw a Tesla parked right out there. <laughs> All right. Good. So you can see the vulnerabilities here, right? A lot of data, right? Estimation, control, learning, right? Uh, so then, then the next area after that, so verification, validation, I'd like to touch on this. How many people have heard that term trust and autonomy? One, two, really? Can we trust autonomy? Can we, right? So there, there's these words being thrown around, trust and autonomy. And, and, and so I like to take it a little further, right? So if you're dealing with you know, a discipline that doesn't have the theoretical foundation, I absolutely believe you should be worried about trust. If you are working with a theory that has theoretical foundation and you have used procedures for gaining trust in those systems that are consistent with over 100 years of practice, there are no trust issues. You just need to follow what you've been doing for 100 years. So in the aerospace science, flying is the safest thing you can do in the world. We all agree, right? Driving is not, right? We all agree with that, right? And the miracle of flight, when things go wrong, it really, really goes wrong. Right? It makes the news. So if you take a look, because of that, the aerospace industry has developed what we call verification and validation procedures for flightworthiness to mission. They have done this over and over again. Right? The aerospace industry brought fly-by-wire, and they spent the better part of a decade with a very disciplined verification validation. The auto industry, drive-by-wire, then picked it up. So what we've been doing is we've just been doing what the aerospace industry's always done. That's why we've been in flight tests for over 13 years. And so if you follow that, and essentially verification validation is very simple. You use your math and your physics, and you predict, if I'm in this situation, here's what I respect the outcome to be. And then you go put an aircraft in that position and then you measure, did the outcome equal my prediction? And then we have this thing called a flight envelope. Different speeds, altitudes. And you do more predictions. And you continuously go to the next highest speed, the next highest altitude. You predict what's supposed to occur. You measure it. And if it correlates, you go to the next point. Now, what's interesting is because you have theory, you actually don't have to do all points. You just got to pick the tough points. And then you move on. And once you know that your vehicle can fly, then you start adding multiple vehicles, and you replicate this process. So I will suggest we know how to do this. It's been done. It continues to be done. And it's not the hurdle that some people suppose that it is for the purposes of the application that I'm talking about. So with that, questions? Yes? So can, they, uh, can the current uh, UAVs learn from their mistakes? From a control and estimation perspective, there is adaptive control. Um, but what you're doing is you're adapting the models based upon what you saw. And those would be like aerodynamics. Hey, my air, I thought my aircraft was flying this way. It's not. I'm going to do an update to the parameters of my aerodynamic model. Winds. I thought my winds aloft. We're going to be certain this is what I'm experiencing. I'm going to update my wind model. On the tactic side, no. They will repeat, give them the same situation, and that's why right? you'll you know, give the same situation to an estimation and controller. The same data, you'll get the same output over and over again. By the way, that's what they like about it. It's very repeatable. That's where the learning, especially when it comes to tactics and strategy, has the opportunity for the AI machine learning.
Great question. In the center? Yes. So I was wondering if you applied the game theoretic solution using machine learning to something else. Have we or would we? I, both, I guess. Um, so, I, I mean, I think if you do take a look at the solution for Go, right, that was a machine learning solution. So we're just drafting off of what they've already done. Um, if you take a look at, um, you know, if you go back to, what was the IBM chess match before you guys were born again? Um, that was just brute force, right? That was a supercomputer just doing absolute brute. But the Go, it, the complexity of Go was such that they, they, were, they used the machine learning we're kind of pivoting off of that. If you take a look at the theory of game theory, right, it is the scalability of the problems I talked about here takes it several order of magnitude more difficult. You can only solve the smallest, like, you know, two by two cubed problems, closed form with game theory. And so you have to be able to have something that can handle that volume of the data, and that's why machine learning is so applicable to it. We're, we are doing today for the problem I described here. Absolutely. That is our focus. We've got active research going on for this as we speak. Uh, Yeah, so our objective is for people, you know, for, if you, so let's go. You have autonomy in your cars today. How many people have a cruise control? All right. How many people have a car that if you are approaching another car too fastly, the brakes are applied? How many people have a car that if they, they've computed that the collision is going to occur, it will handle both brakes and steering, including taking you off the road based upon their determination of what's off the... All right, so I hate to tell you, go read your operator manual a little closer. Right? A lot of the cars today have that in there. So it will steer your car, it will brake your car, it will potentially accelerate your car as well. And it's making the best optimal solution and determination. So I will say, if you look at companies, the automotive companies, they're using, the historical automotive companies are using estimation and control, just like they use to control the engine. So those technologies are actually widely available. Now, that's car on car, right? I think when you start talking about pedestrian and the, and the crosswalk and stuff like that, you have sen uh, sensor phenomenologies and you have challenges there, but Beyond that, you know, that larger question of who, right, who should be most impacted or not, I don't think, I mean, everyone's looking at conservation of momentum here and trying to prevent the collision. If the collision's going to occur, try to put the car in the most advantageous position possible to take the collision. That's where I think that the, that's my understanding for the automotive. For aircraft, it's very simple. We do everything we can to prevent crashes and failures. So let me take a question over here. Yes. Uh, so the whole reason why this technology is being developed is to try to avoid putting people's lives at risk. It's also being used as a deterrent. All right. There's another thing that's going on is. Uh, you are reaching the physical limits of pilots in the vehicles we're designing. Our, our vehicles today can generate more roll rates, generate more Gs, the materials, the aerodynamics, and the performance are there. It's the people who can't handle that from a bioscience perspective. So let me take uh, uh, one here and then one more up here and then we'll... So um, similar to the machine learning, they have, a, they have they, they're able to calculate the most optimal strategies that are maybe, and you said, as you said, uh, calculate the toughest points to focus on, but um, they also have um, 
Do they also have strategies to prioritize what the most probable mistakes are going to happen? Yeah, so, um, so the most probable mistakes, and do we do a determination for that? Um, I don't know if we call them mistakes, we call them contingencies, right? There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So one of the things, and if you want to talk, there's this thing called robust control, right? One of the strategies of robust control is that um, here's my plan, right? But I want to know what other feasible alternatives are to that plan in the event that something bad happens. So one, one such thing is that if, I, uh, if my aircraft becomes impaired, I'm always worried about can I get back to base? Or can I get back to a safe place for that aircraft to have to go into terminal dive? All right, one last question up there. Uh, from applying autonomy and statistics, from applying autonomy and statistics, uh, what have you been following the if any? Yeah, so um, that actually gets, that's, that's a question that gets asked uh, quite often about the, the ethics behind this, because this is clearly uh, a technology that is designed to ensure that uh, you know, the allies around the world um, maintain allies and democracy. So I will say two things. First, um, if the technology exists, someone will bring it to the battlefield. That's always been the case, right? And I want to ensure that our nation and our allies bring it first, right? Uh, two, um, just like the, uh, if you take a look to the fact of when you start to remove pilots and the cost of pilots and the impact to society for that and these just become drones, right? You're either going to make this more appealing or this is gonna even be more untenable to use something like this. I'm betting on it's the more untenable uh, to do this, just like we ended up with a mutual assured destruction uh, stance uh, under the Cold War. But this is a question that comes up um, all the time, but I will say that I think it's imperative that the technology exists, it's imperative that we field it first. So with that, thank you. Oh, yes. So Markov decision problems is a dynamic decision making problem under uncertainty. So the fundamental assumption is, is that I do not observe everything. And that every action, if I want something to occur, it's only a probabilistic outcome. So that's the fundamental to a Markov decision problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. Listen to this. Hey. Yeah. Wow. If you have one question. Yes. Uh, do you think we should add a, a course on autonomous underwater vehicles next year? What do you think? Yeah. You know. How many people would like to do UUVs? So imagine, imagine bright orange riptide UUVs in the MIT pool. And the job is not a single UAV or UUV, but a team, let's say two to three UUVs, and the, they have to go achieve a mission objective that they learn about in real time. I think it's a great idea. We look forward to working with you on that, and maybe some of you can come back as a TA next year for that course. That'd be great. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.